Welcome to GUI and the new web browsers, uh, weekly sync, sync yep, uh, for 23rd of October, I believe, 2019. Uh, I'm with Dietrich and Hack, and we will talk about things from agenda. Feel free to add to agenda while I cover the first one, uh, which is IPFS Companion. Uh, specifically work uh, in IPFS Companion around improving resilience. So in the past weeks, we had a pretty nice contribution uh, from uh, outside developer who added uh, a way to recover from, like basically he created a framework for recovering from failed HTTP requests. And I sort of, uh, in the process of reviewing that, I figured out it's uh, like a wider set of challenges, uh, both technical and uh, UX ones. So I created a project uh, for tracking things related to this. So I call this resilience and offline, and more or less, uh, this is work related to recovering from either uh, technical failures or things like DNS censorship, blocking, uh, or like as well as overlap with offline use cases. Uh, often those things are interconnected. So you can see some stuff already landed in, in master. We did not, I don't think we've uh, released uh, that to the stable channel, but it will eventually bubble up. Uh, for now, we got this means of recovering from failed HTTP requests. So maybe I show that it may be easier to see than to describe. So I have a, a browser with IPFS Companion installed. And right now, you can see redirect to local gateway is enabled. And if I try to open a link to a dead gateway, this domain does not exist. So it will return a DNS failure. However, IPFS Companion automatically detects this IPFS path. And when I open it, it redirected uh, the request to local gateway. So that was already there. However, what we did right now is when you disable this redirect to local gateway and you try to open this dead link, previously it was, would just fail and you would be not able to open this content. However, we have public gateways. And even if you don't run local gateway, IPFS Companion should be able to help you to get to the content you want. So what happens now is if you open this uh, dead link, you get recovered to a public gateway. So that's a pretty good way for uh, healing link rot related to public gateways that go away either by it could be like a contributor simply stopped paying for a domain name or maybe uh, the person just stopped uh, uh, maybe leaving that's a bit morbid but it happens so uh, that way links with content addressed paths uh, still survive so that's for path uh, gateways. Uh, we have a uh, pull request uh, contributed uh, by Colin as well uh, to do the same for subdomain gateways to have this like basically a feature parity for all types of gateways. So if uh, there's a subdomain gateway provided by Cloudflare and everyone is using Cloudflare but at some point Cloudflare decides uh, we don't uh, want this specific type of content on our uh, gateway and they start returning HTTP uh, error codes or simply drop connections, uh, IPFS Companion would be, uh, would be able to recover from those uh, uh, edge cases. Right now, uh, the UX is kind of not existing because you can see if I try to open uh, this dead uh, domain, uh, it get the recovery looks, uh, the way the recovery happens, we just open the same resource on a public gateway uh, in a separate tab. Uh, however, so, so it may be confusing to the user. I plan to uh, create issue about this to do maybe the first time we do recovery for a specific uh, that gateway 
we probably could display this landing page similar to what uBlock is doing when you have uh, a link that has a lot of tracking embedded in uh, like uh, query parameters. Uh, what uBlock uh, does uh, gives you an option. Do you gives you a context what is happening, and do you want to like go to that URL permanently or just this time? We probably could do the same thing. Uh, use that as a means of educating users. So tell like, oh, this gateway you are trying to, oh, like this resource you are trying to open from uh, a public gateway, we are in, uh, your browser is not able to load it because either server is dead or DNS query failed or something. And there should be an option to, yes, open, but just this time, or like, yeah, always fix uh, dead links from this uh, gateway. Uh, something like that. Uh, I feel that would be much uh, both like re reduce the su surprise that the URL changed and also like give uh, our, our, us means of educating users uh, about the value uh, IPFS companion and generally IPFS can bring uh, into like healing those broken links. So that's more or less um, the uh, resilience and offline project. Um, I guess that's it uh, on my end. This is uh, this is really nice because I feel like it kind of sets itself up for the, the, su the, the, yeah. the suspense. <laughs> it sets us up for it's kind of uh, one of the prerequisites for a, a world where co-hosting is available and allows us to react by reserving content that us or maybe even other people might have. Yeah, and I especially like like this uh, that we will be supporting like subdomains pretty soon because at some point we will have uh, local host subdomains, and basically this uh, like we will be reusing origin uh, based uh, security sandboxing uh, for websites in a, in a more like simplest manner. Right now we would be recovering to DNS uh, that link. Um, but in the future, we will be able to like redirect the local gateway, which, which is like the, the end goal uh, for uh, people to just share links to gateways and don't care if a gateway actually exists. And if it fails, people would know, oh, I just need to this extension and, and stuff will continue working. Um, Hack, do you want to talk about IPv6? Yes, I do. Last week we talked about like the GOIP thing and the idea was to just use the new database and keep the format. But then I was looking <laughs> and I don't believe you can keep the current format and use IPv6 because we use the long format of the IP yeah. to store the first and the last one. So it won't be possible with the the IPv6. Also, there are some variables that change their names. They have also I new variables. I wonder if someone could help me the, like set a format for this uh, so I can finally work oh, yeah. on this. Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, totally. I bel I'm wondering if is this is this problem just with uh, IPv6 database for uh, GeoIP, or is it like a general change of the format for IPv4 as well? I'm asking because perhaps we could update the existing library uh, just to like just update IPv4 and then maybe create a separate library for IPv6. Um, or I believe we can do that. Yeah, like there are some, there are mo there is more information on the new data set. I don't know if it's worth including or not. Uh, we we only care about like country and city, I believe, right? Uh, for I, for web UI, I mean. For yeah, for web UI. <laughs> yeah, and I think like, I'm not uh, familiar with the old data set for which use case it was uh, like optimized. Yeah. 
uh, but I believe, I believe like for web U, the current iteration of web UI, we don't want to provide like, like the city is the, the granulation level we want to focus on. And probably uh, if, if the old library does not support that we could, yeah, so, so that, that's the thing. We don't want to like duplicate data sets, but if we, we are able to like optimize both the size and lookup times for this specific use case of web UI, we may be, we may be looking at the situation where we want a specific uh, data set, which can be like configured when you initialize this library. Because right now it's just like a single data set, right? Um, and another thing is like the what we have now only has like nine fields country code country name region code as and so on but the new data set has a lot of things uh as much more than what we have now it'll it has time zones if it's in european union what's the name of the continent the code of the continent the country is code the subdivision one oh man the code I don't know what that is. Oh yeah, I, I, I see that it's like much wider discussion. Uh, I, I think let's just create an issue in the IPFS Geo IP. Uh, okay. How to tackle this new format. If you can like specify what, what was in the old one and what's in the new one, we can uh, figure out something we'll out. Move. Yeah, yeah. I, I just was under an impression they, they simply like, oh, just uh, shuffled some stuff around in their website, but the stuff usually Kept, was kept the same, but it seems like they revamped the entire thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. More on that soon. Uh, cool. Performance and, I, and CPU consumption of web UI. Is there anything left? Or did you fix everything, Hark? I, I added this. Thanks for, thanks for pushing those issues all the way down. Thanks for fixing them everywhere. Uh, did, all, did all of that land, or is there still more work to do there? Uh, the, I'm wondering if status page is consuming too much CPU. Uh, also, I told Molly, and they told me, we, uh, we use the app idle bundle as a um, way to refetch stuff after a number of seconds. And that's not what the bundle is for. And it told me probably that I should take a look at it to see what it is actually doing. I don't, I don't, I don't actually know what it is doing because it wasn't me who did this at the time. And I haven't yet looked at it. But about Clear's page, I believe it's working like well, I don't know yeah is yeah, it loading yeah, we, is it loading <laughs> we we are making a significant performance improvements for for the peers page which uh, gets pretty hairy if you have like thousands of peers and I'm like specifically forcing my local node to have like 4k of peers just to see how it impacts performance <laughs> uh, so yeah um, I believe like the CPU consumption of web UI that was reported in the original issue was mostly for like web U for IPFS desktop use case. Uh, and that's when like people keep running a status page in, in the background tab or something like that. So I think that's, that one is tackled. Uh, however, like improvement of peers and other uh, peer screen will be uh, landing soon. That's like open here. And local peers. Yeah. So I'd say uh, for the status page, we are pretty good. Uh, for for peers page, uh, we need to land this uh, here. Yep. Uh, in the like in the long run, uh, the problem with the status page is that we are constantly polling. Uh, I believe like bandwidth stats API. And we are polling that even if we are not on the status page. So that's like this graph of bandwidth over time has date has actual historical data, even if you like switch to different tab. Um, 
which is sort of like suboptimal, but we we would need uh, more. Uh, we probably would need more advanced uh, stats API, which has a knowledge of historical data, uh, and but that requires like, changes to go like Go IPFS and JS IPFS. Uh, so that's probably something that may happen if we talk with uh, talk about. Uh, like API v1 or something like that, and start gathering uh, those needs of uh, APIs that are missing or limitations of existing APIs. But given the APIs we have right now, I don't see we can like improve much. Like request-wise, we could like we remove the uh, overhead of redrawing uh, canvas. Uh, that's about it, I think. Yeah. By the way, I, I was not thinking. Uh, the, about the nearby peers, it will be weird if we have the whole GUI peak uh, uh, database with the nearby peers because I will be able to think to see that, for example, a peer in the US, which is which was in the US before, uh, is a nearby peer and it's not. This was really confusing what I just said, but. Oh, totally. yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 if someone is uh, watching this in the future, uh, <laughs> the background uh, is that uh, the Geo IP database we have in Web UI is a bit out of date, and some IPs uh, naturally get sold and purchased and moved and reassigned. And I had like notes from the United States that I had super fast connection that was faster than li than light because that IP got reassigned to Germany, but web UI was still showing that US and I had like from Poland to US 20 milliseconds, which is like not possible. <laughs> so I have um, some of those too. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, but we are working on updating the Go IP database. So that's the background. We probably should mention that in the beginning of this section, <laughs> so, uh, yep. Work in progress. Uh, G-trick, thanks, metrics. Yes, wanted to see if we have made any progress on filling out the, I believe, four or six boxes in the test matrix that you designed. Yeah, right so th those boxes, uh, the problem, like, like the challenge is, I, I looked at that uh, this week and the general pro, maybe not a problem, but the challenge is that we are not using Azure in web UI for anything. And all the other apps are using Azure's built-in support for running tests against Node, uh, different browsers, uh, different Electron context, because there is like the, the background one and the, the, the renderer one. Um, so that's probably something we need to uh, figure it out first. Do we want to create this test infrastructure. Oh, and another thing is that those tests, uh, when run from JSIPFS, if you want to run web UI tests from uh, JSIPFS, uh, Azure takes care of that. There's like Azure uh, test external command, and that command basically uh, checks out the repository, uh, installs dependencies, and then runs uh, I believe either build or or just test uh, npm run test. Uh, so the thing is, we need to uh, figure it out a way both to ensure our test command, which would be run by Azure, does what we want, which is basically like running all the tests. And another thing is. Uh, Make made sure those there's a way for running those tests again against different uh, runtimes. Right now, I think it, that Azure Test External simply runs those tests, and that's it. Uh, there's no like way to specify I want to run those tests against uh, Node or something else. So we either run it's like sequentially one after another as a part of this one command, 
or we extend Azure's uh, test external uh, with like opt-in capability to like parallelize those uh, runtime pipelines. So like Node, Fire, like Node, uh, or like Firefox, Chrome, and uh, Electron are tested in separate uh, Docker instances or something like that. Um, so that's kind of um, more challenging space, uh, and and that's uh, more or less I was mostly trying to understand what's already there and what's missing. Because uh, 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 correct me if I got this right. In Web UI, we simply decided uh, when we started uh, Web UI that like Azure is, at the time was mostly used for libraries, and that's why we did not pick it because uh, there was like not not much uh, value added at at that time uh, by Azure for like end user uh, application, and we are simply running uh, like just tests. And I think we have a puppeteer and like simple puppeteer end-to-end -end test, um, which is sort of like hard coded to Chrome. Uh, so that's a long way for me to say that we need to like refactor all the tests that in Web UI to get to the point we are we can like feed them into the mold of those. Uh, uh, Azure like uh, test pipelines. Um, I'm not sure if it's useful, but that's uh, what I was able to like figure out this week. That that is incredibly useful. So that means that before we can start filling in those boxes, there are other new boxes that need to be filled or added. Are there issues tracking setting up Azure support? Um, uh, not yet. Also, Firefox Nightly, I think, has preliminary support for a native puppeteer protocol. Oh, yeah, to yeah totally. We're get and, getting there for, to that point. Eventually, the, that mess will be. Oh, yeah, that's the, that's the point. Like, uh, Azure solved a lot of this stuff already. So that's why I'm, like, the first thing I want to see is, are we able to simply, like, either mi migrate or set up, like, Next to existing tests, uh, set, set up uh, Azure-based uh, ones, mostly because like Azure takes care of all this like uh, orchestration for running stuff against different uh, like Chromium and Firefox. Totally, uh, I, I believe they are either using like Firefox Headless or or maybe this like Firefox Puppet or something internally. Uh, Hugo probably knows the knows details, but uh, that's nice. I did not realize that Azure takes care of even figuring out all the browser bits too. I thought it was more like the orchestration of oh. pulling from all the different repos. And then oh yeah, yeah, like uh, you are able to like, in JS IPFS, you are able to run a specific test in a specific runtime. So you can grab uh, just this test and I want to run it in web browser and then I want to check if it also works in Electron. Uh, and, and we got, and that's just like one command in Azure. Uh, so I just, the, that's why I, the first thing I would like to do is to see if we are able to reuse that because if we want, like, if we start, like, writing custom orchestration for, like, puppeteer things for, like, separately for Firefox, separately for Chromium, uh, then we run into the, the issue that Hag described, like, IPFS desktop also is not using Azure, so we would have to, like, perhaps uh, set up something similar at some point there. So maybe uh, looking if we are able to switch to Azure, maybe not for build, but for tests or like a separate way of running tests. That would if, be will, will that get us into a place where other repos can run their tests against things like Web UI and just like, so, you know, it really ultimately that, that's all we want, right? We want people to have configurable IPFS, whether it's JSI Professor Go and configurable version against configurable web UI against configurable companion or, or desktop, right? Um, we need to be able to have each one of those be configurable parameters and just say, hey, go, go run that set of tests so that, uh, that we, we can run our tests to make sure that change X that you made against version Y of that, of that repo works fine. And yeah. then vice versa. So yeah, I, I, they're I shipping new version of, of Go IPFS click a button and it runs all of our tests. Don't have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah, I believe like we, we probably want to replace that, like the default test command to run like everything. Uh, 
and then provide docs for people who want to uh, uh, just run like tests in a watch mode when you, those tests like reload or just run tests against a specific browser. But by default, we probably want to have this like one command which runs it sequentially. Uh, yeah, so I probably uh, comment on the existing issue when I posted the, the, the matrix. I just like was in the middle of uh, like looking at this uh, before this call. So I want to like finish looking and probably comment uh, tomorrow. Uh, yeah, how do, how do you feel about uh, trying to reuse Azure tests for, for tests? Uh, let's try it. <laughs> Let's try it. Let's try it. Yeah, because I really don't want to write this. Uh, I, like in in past, I I wrote a lot of like custom orchestration, and it's a burden to maintain, and that's why we have Azure to basically do that in one place if it's yeah. possible. Um, yeah. It, it, I, one, why I want to underscore too that for the I think this was this is basically the P zero effectively the P zero for for us for this quarter too, is to be able to get that testing scenario so that those boxes are covered. Uh, or at least we have the infrastructure to be able to do that or that so other people can run those tests in a way that is automatable. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I, I, I think like if, when we meet next time, we we'll probably have a better uh, understanding if we are like going with Azure and if so, how much work, what needs to happen. Um, I probably will uh, ask uh, Hack uh, on what's actually happening right now in end-to-end -end tests because uh, I just like, just briefly uh, looked at this. I did not look at it before, so I'm, it's new for me. But yeah, yeah I think we, we we can do this, and I would spend uh, some time on trying to reuse Azure because it's probably the, the like the cheapest and the best option right now. I, I added this next issue to you. You said you were thin on topics, so I just added all the topics. I, all the topics. Oh. oh, Terry, hi. Hi, can I ask a question before I have to leave? Sure. Do any of you have yeah, so resources for, that you like to uh, use to learn about the regular files API, the like add and cat and get beyond the docs or Alan's class from camp. I'm just looking to add resources to the new tutorial. Resources. Do you, do you mean people to review the tutorial or material to add? No, to edu educational things to link to. Ah. So, is there like an issue when where we can like drop links if we remember them? Sure, I'll find the link to the PR for the tutorial and drop it here, and then you can feel free to add any suggestions there. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I, 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 I saw something, but like slips my mind right now. Um, oh, nice job. Thank you. Saving me time. Um, and also, we're still revamping Joe's, revamping some of the like order of things and making some tweaks. But yes, we also would love more people looking at it. Thank you, Enrique, for taking a, a first peek. So yes, we are also happy to have more proofers, but it, we probably should wait a couple of days till it gets a little bit more settled before you bother. Awesome. Uh, yep, thanks for the link. We'll, we'll drop something after the call. Uh, Wikipedia, let's do some issue garden. Yeah, we should. Um, what, so one of the things I wanna to get to is to where other people, where we can have other people help and jump in on this um, with a nice list of things that we know need to be done. Um, and I know Lytle, you were, there were some things you wanted to get done first. Yep. Uh, but it would it would be great if if we eat. some people could even help with those things. Yep. Um, uh, I can like uh, maybe uh, I had no time to go back uh, like circle back to this. But uh, last time I went over the is issues. I marked some issues related to the way s actual snapshots are generated, and that's probably the fair like like P zero to address first. Uh, so. Uh, 
Yeah, I think I think I was wondering too, from a higher level than that, when you say that's P zero, do we have a? Is there a uh, plan of record yet? Like, what what is the set of steps that we want to be able to get to at least automatable published on IPFS snapshots? Yeah, so there there are two issues. One issue is like update specific mirror, and I'll tell you why in a moment. And another is uh, uh, language specific. You mean? Yeah, yeah. So the long term uh, goal is to automate snapshot updates. So we should like automatically detect new snapshot. Uh, it should like build in the background and then uh, a human jumps in and simply says, okay, this looks good. Let's, let's publish this. Um, however, before we go there, we need to first of all streamline and polish the process of generating snapshots. And uh, the test case, which I suggest to start with, is a smaller Wikipedia. We already have a mirror of, of Turkish Wikipedia. So that's why I created issue for it. Uh, it's smaller than the English one. English one is, I believe, 650 gigabytes. This one is around 40, maybe. And so it's much, much smaller, and you can effectively build it within one day on regular like laptop um, so the task list is to like create a new snapshot using the instructions from like readme see what goes wrong uh, and basically like write uh, an exp experience report uh, i had some like issues with the rust script we had and other things uh, and then look at the generated snapshot and see if it has this canonical link which was an issue before with search engines fixed and then uh, we add a footer at the bottom of every page uh, describing what, what was the source when it was generated and show this thing works and if those things work we would uh, uh, pin it and update the DNS link. And then we can talk with uh, IPFS cluster team to set up collaborative pinning cluster solution, but it's like a separate thing, right? Um, so there, so there's, there's, it seems like there's two discrete parts. Yep. The first is the snapshot generation, and that is not IPFS specific at all. And we can have, we need somebody to be able to do some testing on that generation process to verify that the steps are correct and that the generated snapshot is correct. Totally. And, that's, and, then, and then that's something ultimately we like, we just want to put in a Docker container or something like that, right? So that people can just, yep. so that we can put that in, in automation somewhere and just put it on a schedule. Yeah, the problem is uh, we are not using the official Zim extract tool. We, we, like we created, a custom one which enables us to unpack it uh, and add it to IPFS and then we do some additional pro pro processing. So it's a challenge to streamline the process because right now if you go to the readme there's a lot of uh, manual steps that need to happen uh, and before we like invite uh, third parties we should figure out those scripts because those scripts are too complex and a lot of them simply the, the depend on stuff that's too old so it, it's basically uh, some time needs to be invested into like clearing this up okay so so is there an is there an issue for for that work that needs to be done uh mostly uh yep uh, there is uh, under snapshots i believe there is uh there is wrapper script for building snapshots and uh, the meta issue about making it more usable. Um, those are pretty old, uh, but de details are there and, and some challenges uh, wrote down. Um, probably I could uh, go over those issues and like close them and create like a single one. Because right now this, all those problems are scattered uh, across multiple issues. It's okay, I'm, I'm taking notes in the notes as you're speaking. All right noting which issues but yeah having a even if it was just a clear plan an idea of what needs to be fixed will help other people and i was thinking of trying to organize just like a, a saturday hackathon or something like that at some point and get some people together to 
to hack on some of this and try to get us prepped for doing fun Wikipedia stuff in January. I, I added the next issue too. There is a, a browser vendor that is inquiring of, about what those patches look like that Chrome or that Brave used to whitelist the Chrome OS sockets APIs in Brave. Do you have a link to the Chrome or the Brave changes that they made to be able to whitelist those for us? Actually, yes. Great. Actually, yes. I can, uh, let me quickly. Because when, you, when you're talking to a browser vendor and like, hey, could you do some stuff for us? They're like, we'd have to figure out how to do all that. But if you're like, hey, look, here's how it's done. Like, oh, we can just flip that and make it a build option or a config option. It makes the story a lot easier. Yeah, I can, uh, it, it may take longer than I expected, but I will, I can add it to notes uh, after the call. Cool. And this is, it's kind of, um, this is, we talked a little bit about doing a post browser update post specifically about uh, the technical details of how the brave changes were implemented, both the kind of the, the hijinks that you had to do inside companion for things like local gateway and stuff like that. Um, explain people the, 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 the lovely scenario of running happy JS inside of a content page inside of a browser. <laughs> and, uh, also, some of these some of these unique bits as well, um, and so that we can get the kind of the whole picture. It would be really neat at some point, maybe before the end of the quarter, like maybe even during lab week, we could just steal an hour and dump a bunch of stuff in a in a document. Oh, oh yeah, and actually, it it would make a pretty good blog post because uh, it's more like visual. I believe it's I can write a wall of text. However, like I got, I can like sketch something and Agatha can make a pretty good uh, visualization of all those blocks and how, what's inside what. And I feel it visually will look pretty cool. Yeah. It'll, it, it'll look like uh, most people's client server diagrams, except it's all running inside the browser. Like Rube Goldberg's machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, and ju just like to close on the like uh, what Brave did to whitelist access to our APIs. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll find the PR. It's uh, the, the code is public. Uh, uh, long story short, is that they have an internal list of blessed extension IDs, and if uh, extension ID matches, because uh, the, the, each extension is si cryptographically signed, so. Uh, each extension, uh, if uh, ID matches, you get access to a speci specific APIs. Uh, and for companion, that means Chrome sockets. Um, yeah. Cool, I want, do you know, well, I'll, I'll trace that issue. If you've dropped the initial issue, we can spelunk a little bit and find whether or not they had to do any underlying uh, in, the, in the guts of Chrome, anything to be able to access those specific APIs, expose them to an extension context and scope, things like that. Because the whitelisting is one part of it, um, but I also I just kind of assumed that in the internal code uh, those APIs weren't universally accessible either. But that's something we can I would, we could probably just ping Jocelyn about too. Oh yeah, uh, I actually actually found it, so I I drop it. In. Awesome, thank you. I believe that was yeah. Um, is it? Yeah, that's the one. Yep. Um, all right. So drop that in the notes. Uh, IPFS co-host. It's just a quick update. Oli already moved the IPFS co-host repository to IPFS shipyard. So. Reviews are up. Welcome. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so IPFS Co-host is a, a website, website co-hosting solution that uh, uh, Olizilla did before co-hosting was a thing. So it, it initially it was theme-based, and now we are moving to it, like the underlying implementation from being low-level pin API to this like MFS based. Um, yeah, and 
Can I just yeah. But like the IPFS co-hosts as IPFS as a dependency, and I wonder if we should remove that. It basically spins a daemon if there's no uh, no online daemon right now, and it's an interesting question. I oh, yeah. to npx install npx IPFS co-host, and it is downloading IPFS JS IPFS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, that's like a separate topic. Do do you know if we have like an issue to discuss that? Because uh, like the the okay. discussion here is we sort of if we implement uh, the co-hosting spec in IPFS co-host, it's basically like a JS library, JS app slash library, and then we could reuse this co-hosting library in both companion and desktop. Uh, the, the, I think the, like the question was if we start thinking about this as a library instead of like standalone application, do we need to bundle the JS IPFS daemon with it, or should it just be like HTTP client and like take less space or like have less less dependency? Um, I don't think we can answer that right now. But I know. <laughs> Something I'll open an discuss. issue. Yep. And I'll be waiting for reviews on the PR. Yep. Just to, to clarify, so this, this PR updates Ollie's original IPFS co-host scripts to implement the specification for lazy co-hosting? And all the other commands. All of the co-hosting. Yes. All of the co-hosting. Uh, awesome. Awesome IPFS. Yes. Who's taking care of awesome IPFS? Once in a while, I take a look at the PRs. I merge some of them. I don't merge other of them, but I'm not. I'm no authority to pick what uh, should be merged and what should not be merged. And previously, it was who was him. Let me just check the. I'm pretty sure this question was raised before. Uh, I believe it was. And it, it, it was usually just people who noticed that this repo is not like well groomed. Uh, they took it, care of it. It sometimes stuff. is. I mean, sometimes the guy from, uh, I think he's from Brus from Austria or Germany. Uh, they, he was at IPFS camp. It processes some of the issues mm -hmm. as well. I see mostly him and Hack in there. I, I think it's like uh, we probably could leverage uh, leverage community help with this. Like uh, as well, may, not sure if Jen uh, Jen is responsible for writing a IPFS weekly newsletter, and after I believe she may be either interested in following those PRs uh, for. The newsletter, but as well, maybe she could help with uh, if if she's reading all those uh, incoming new apps uh, anyway. Uh, give so uh, act as a, some initial filter. Um, ask yeah, her I I think that that hacks question though. Like before we add any peop more people into it, hacks question is the salient one, which is what is the criteria that we use to be able to determine yeah. if something should be added or not. And I know there's an open issue for that in that repo yeah. and no clear answer. <laughs> so I think maybe, like maybe if, maybe if, maybe if, maybe at next week at this meeting, if we dedicate maybe 15, 20 minutes to just saying, okay, what if we develop, what would those criteria be? How could we write them up in a way that is easy and for anyone to walks up to the repo to be able to implement fairly? And then, and then, yep. it should, then yeah. anybody else can walk up and do it. It would be. Easy. Oh yeah, it should be basically a written down uh, list that of yeah list that is used to uh, evaluating PRs. So um, totally. I I mean I think there's a there's a separate set of issues around the usability of the, of adding PRs to begin with. Like you have to add stuff yeah. in a bunch of different places. Where, like, it's kind of crazy. But. Yeah. Yeah. We also uh, probably have a, a separate problem around things that were added, but no, are no longer there or are no longer maintained. Um, okay. At this but point, we have a lot of stuff there. 
the CI checks if all websites exist. Okay. So sometimes I remove the ones that are failing, but if the link is for the IPFS gateway, it is it does not it it is not checked because it might fail just because. Okay. I I wonder if, if yeah if I was like I wonder if anybody else is using that to as a pinning service. How often does the CI check that? Uh, I think it's just on merge and commits. So not a very reliable pinning service. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't check IPFS URL, so it just IPFS is, it doesn't work as a pinning service. Anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I think that's a good plan. And probably if we don't allocate those like five minutes to 10 minutes next week, uh, we won't find I, time. 20. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's a five minute. Yeah, that's true. Me neither. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, having uh, some sort of like a policy or criteria w would certainly help. Um, yeah, there, there are like 21 PRs and I don't know what to do with them. There are some, of, some from August last year. I'm thinking about closing the ones where we asked something and they did not reply. Mm -hmm. uh, Seems uh, fair. Uh, yeah, an another option is uh, for this specific repo, there are like bots who like close issues and PRs which were not like merged within the time window or did not like receive reply. No. Uh, so that would remove the burden of like going over like 20 PRs and seeing if there's any update or something. Okay. Yep. Cool. Anything else? Are we so efficient that we finished five minutes before <laughs> before the the end of the hour? That was that was good stuff, though. Yeah. Time well spent. Time well spent. All right. Um, can, can you hear the uh, construction that's happening? It's directly yes. below my floor. It's glor glorious sounds of hell. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care. Bye, see you all.